All right, well, I'm going to get us started and, and let people trickle in as they come. But first, I want to welcome you all to our speaker series today. We're very excited to have Cameron Burris with us today. Cameron is going to be answering questions that some of you have submitted, and she's going to be talking to you all about the strengths, the stereotypes, and the pitfalls of mindfulness. Um, Karen is a licensed clinical Cameron is a licensed clinical social worker and a yoga instructor with almost a decade of experience in the social services industry. She combines her clinical skill set with a holistic, integrative approach to her work with her clients. Cameron has her own private practice, Intuitive Minds Counseling and Wellness, where she offers her services to the community. Um, we also have a student moderator with us today, which I'm excited about. Her name is Peyton Cook. And Peyton is a first year honor student at Florida State, and she's earning a dual degree in international affairs and creative writing, as well as minoring in economics. So she is staying busy. Um, but we're excited to have you both here. And really, we just want to jump right in with Cameron. And I'm just going to let you kind of um, start us off, Cameron, introduce yourself, and um, just tell us a little bit about what you do and why you're here today. Absolutely. Thank you, Amy, for the introduction. Um, thank you all for making the time out um, to listen to me talk uh, for the next 20 minutes, almost straight-ish, and then to um, listen to me and Peyton kind of jump back and forth as we take moderator questions. Um, and if any questions come up, feel free to drop it into the chat um, just so that we can um, offer you some answers or some solutions to whatever it is that you may be dealing with or whatever may be showing up in your life right now. Um, just like Amy said, my name's Cameron. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, uh, but before I was a social worker, I was an undergrad student at Florida State. Um, I was also an honors major. Um, ironically, started off in the law legal program, realized it really wasn't for me, uh, transitioned over into sociology and psychology where I double majored, uh, wrote an honors thesis, did a few different study abroad programs, some internships abroad um, in Spain, studied abroad in London, which was really cool, did an exchange program in the Netherlands. Um, so definitely took advantage of a lot of Florida State's travel programs um, and some of their scholarship programs as well. Uh, finished my undergraduate degree with an honors thesis on motivation to study English as a second language, a kind of like a combination of all of the studies that I've done abroad and all of the interactions I've had with different people in different cultures, uh, which really helped me dip my toe into the research field. Um, today, my goal is to talk to you today about mindfulness and not just what mindfulness is, uh, because there are a lot of different floating definitions of mindfulness depending on um, where you've been introduced, uh, meaning if it was introduced through a meditation teacher, through a yoga class, through Instagram, uh, through TikTok, uh, that's gonna give you very different insight into what mindfulness is. So I'd like to give you a more nuanced perspective into what mindfulness entails. Um, and then give you some tools maybe to help you use mindfulness practices in a meaningful way. Um, so like Amy said, I aptly titled this presentation, The Strains, Stereotypes, and Pitfalls of, Mad or of Mindfulness. And the reason why I did that is because I was seeing a lot out there about what mindfulness is. I mean, also a lot of things about what mindfulness isn't. Um, I think as college students, mindfulness practices can be a really powerful tool uh, for self-improvement, for reflection, and for transformation. But I think sometimes if we're not taught how to use that tool critically, uh, we may end up being complacent with some of the things in our lives, being complacent with some of the uh, systemic issues that might be affecting our stress, our anxiety, or some of those underlying symptoms that we're hoping mindfulness can fix. Um, and so a big part of mindfulness practice is definitely being able to ask questions and ask a lot of questions. So, um, what is my background experience in mindfulness? I think that's a really important question to answer um, before I dive into all of this. Yes, I do have my master's in clinical social work, but you can be a clinical social worker or a therapist and not have any sort of mindfulness experience. Actually, my mindfulness practice came out of um, 
you know, just my own personal life experiences uh, coming out of difficult relationships. I was fresh out of college. I was only like 20 years old when I graduated. Um, and then I was, I got a job working for the sheriff's office in child protection. Um, and I don't know if anybody has experience working or being caught up in the child welfare system, um, but you know, it can be a very overworked, underpaid uh, profession. And so I used, or I started going to a mindfulness teacher. Uh, so I would drive out to these classes once or twice a week uh, where I would get meditation practice. And then there would be a lecture kind of conversation back and forth dialogue about some of the principles of mindfulness, about how to practice it. Um, and really diving into some of the spirituality of mindfulness practices as well. Um, I started that when I was 20 or 21, I'm now 29. So I've been doing that for about eight or so years on and off. I found mindfulness is a really great tool for um, quieting my mental thoughts and some of that mental chatter, but also when we're able to get to a place of stillness of really looking at and examining any areas of balances and imbalances in my life. And when I say balance and imbalance, I mean, what are some parts of my life or some aspects of my life that aren't really in alignment with my values? For example, if I'm working, you know, child protection, 65 hours a week, 70 hours a week, but I like having, you know, regular full-time 40 hours so I can actually live a life outside of that. What is the cost of the additional hours that I'm putting into my work? Um, that's what a mindfulness practice can really be geared towards as well. Not just the deep breathing, right? And being able to help you get through an exam that you've got coming up, even though that's really important, but it's got some long-term impact as well. So um, this is a quote that's taken from a book, Make Mindfulness uh, by Ronald E. Uh, Purser. I'll go ahead and drop that name down in the chat too, in case anybody's interested. And it says, anything that offers success in an unjust society without trying to change or challenge the system isn't revolutionary, it's just coping. Um, and I think that really speaks to some of the pitfalls and some of the dangers of mindfulness practices today. I think a lot of the times when we see mindfulness and it's almost become such a buzzword um, that it's kind of taken on a life of its own. So we see a lot of corporate offices, a lot of agencies saying that they offer mindfulness or they offer a work-life balance, right? But in practice, some of that mindfulness might look like, you know, maybe once a quarter they have a yoga instructor come out and teach yoga. Yeah, you might feel real relaxed at the end of that, but what does their leadership structure look like, right? Because that's really going to help promote work-life balance more so than getting a yoga class every once in a while. Um, so we really have to think about how we can use mindfulness as a tool for transfer transformation and not just a tool to help us cope through um, some of the difficulties and some of the barriers and stressors and oppression that we may deal with day to day. Um, so a lot of the times I found with this whole mindfulness revolution that instead of setting practitioners free, um, not just having freedom from their own thought, but freedom from some of the internalization of our cultural messages around what we should be doing, around hyper productivity and how we always need to be on the go, even though COVID was supposed to slow things down and that seemed to only happen for a couple of weeks and then things kind of sped back up, right? Um, so instead it's helping people to adjust to some of the conditions that's causing some of these problems, right? So we have people who are complacent or even worse, who are internalizing some of the stressors that they're experiencing and making it their own instead of externalizing the problem, uh, which is also a clinical term, externalizing the problem and really seeing that problem in the context of the larger society. All right, so mindfulness can be a great tool for tuning out mental rumination. Um, it enhances our ability to recognize automatic reactions, automatic responses, uh, maybe when we're acting out of unconscious behaviors, so behaviors that we don't even realize that we're doing on a regular basis. When we get into a regular practice of being able to slow down our activity, right, slow down our thoughts, and be mindful of the breath and the body, uh, that can be a really great, great tool for recognizing automatic reaction. It also encourages us to pay full attention to the present, 
uh, by helping us to accept our thoughts, our feelings, um, our sensations that we might feel in the body, even things like boredom, right? It's not a form of escapism. Um, it's not asking you to find something different to do or find something different to think about if we're feeling bored, if we're hungry, if we're tired. It's asking you to sit with those uncomfortable feelings and watch how it passes over time. Um, there are even a lot of present day practitioners. I don't know if y'all are familiar with John Kabat-Zinn. Um, he is a practitioner who came up with this mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is about an eight to 12 week program, I believe, um, that's designed to help people reduce stress, depression, and anxiety symptoms through a regular mindfulness practice. Um, but with all of the benefits, so we hear a lot of benefits about how great mindfulness is uh, for helping with anxiety and depression and stress and to help you overcome uh, difficult work-life imbalances, right? To help you to strengthen relationships. We also have to discuss some of those potential pitfalls. Um, one of those potential pitfalls is how mindfulness can be colonized and then repackaged and then reproduced um, in order to fit into a hyper productivity culture. Like I said before, the purpose of a mindfulness practice is to help you slow down and view areas of balance and imbalance in your life. Many of us, especially college students. So y'all are among a population um, that for better or for worse is really a part of that productivity culture, right? Uh, you might be full-time or part-time students. You might be juggling full-time or part-time jobs. You might be maintaining a family, whether you're a single parent or whether you have additional help from another spouse or from other family members uh, to help lighten that load. Um, you may want to have a personal life or try to in the midst of all of that. So there are all of these things that we're kind of trying to juggle. Um, and sometimes that can lead us into states and periods of hyper productivity. Well, if we don't recognize that, right, if we don't recognize that we are part of a hyper productive culture, then what can end up happening? Well, we can experience really high levels of stress. We can try to use a mindfulness practice to help kind of decrease that stress a little bit. But really what that mindfulness practice might do is highlight all of the reasons for the stressors in your life and empower you to take action on them, which doesn't always feel so good, right? Especially if we have underlying mental health conditions. So these are some of the other considerations that you want to um, think about, especially when you're starting to begin or build your own mindfulness practice. Also, for any future clinicians out there who are psych majors or social work majors or, you know, planning to be in a helping field, keep in mind that mindfulness practices aren't for everybody. Uh, typically, most uh, people who are certified in mindfulness would recommend screening out for certain mental health conditions. That can include, ironically, the very conditions that many mindfulness practices are trying to treat, like anxiety and depression. Why would anxiety and depression be a couple of um, conditions that we may want to consider not initiating a mindfulness practice with, at least not before careful assessment and intervention? The reason is because there's a lot of negative self-talk uh, with those types of conditions. A big part of mindfulness is attuning to the internal state. So if your internal state is full of mental chatter that is very negative, that is judgmental, um, that may feel um, or have thoughts of suicidality or aggressive ideations, and you are being asked to tune in and focus on those thoughts, then instead of those thoughts decreasing, they might actually really increase. Um, so that's something to really think about. Uh, mindfulness practices along with therapeutic support. Also for certain conditions like delusional thinking, psychosis, uh, manic behaviors, um, right, where there are delusions of thinking, where there's often magical thinking or kind of grandiose thinking, um, thinking that we're bigger than we are, thinking that we don't need things like rest or food to function. Um, it may be hard for them to um, submit to reality testing. So really understanding the present moment that they're in. Well, if the whole purpose of mindfulness is to understand the present moment, how can we do this with individuals whose reality testing is not currently in the present? Okay, so that's something else to think about. And then trauma survivors, uh, survivors of 
uh, who may have conditions like PTSD, who may have conditions like disassociation or depersonalization um, or derealization where they really feel disconnected from their body or in their body and they feel disconnected from everybody else in the external world. Um, if they're being asked to attune to the internal and their internal is so disconnected that they don't have the tools uh, to really recognize and connect the dots um, and start to recalibrate their system um, so that they can understand it a little bit better. And that may cause more harm introducing mindfulness practices than it is you know, being helpful. So these are a few things that we really have to think about when it comes to adopting and using a mindfulness practice. Yes, there are many tools that I can teach you about pausing in between classes to take deep breaths or asking yourself, you know, certain questions or reflection before you take a test. Um, but really developing a strong mindfulness practice is going to start by identifying your values, identifying your priorities and making sure that your priorities are aligning with your values that's a really big part of being present, right? After we do that, then we can develop a system of practices or daily exercises that can really help us to enhance our own mindfulness practice. Uh, we are the most mindful when we're able to be present. If we're always thinking about the next thing that we have to go do, if our schedules are so busy, uh, then we probably need mindfulness more than the next person. Um, so I really hope that um, especially as future leaders, um, as future educators in whatever major you're in, you know, across a lot of service industries today, there are really high levels of burnout. There are also in helping professions, really high levels of compassion fatigue. And so it is imperative that present and future clinicians find innovative ways to perform at their natural best, even if that is not reflective of what society or mainstream culture or your family or your significant other or your friends think is the level that you should be performing at. All right, I wanna pause right now so that I can be mindful of the time and pass it over to Peyton or Amy um, so we can start some Q&A. Awesome, thank you so much for being here. This is great. I think that especially for honor students, there's a lot that goes on in schools. And so I think it's great to talk about mindfulness from a perspective that isn't just the take a deep breath and relax, because oftentimes it's really hard to do when there's so much happening. So for our pre-submitted questions, the first thing we have is, with all that we juggle as college students, how can we begin to stay mindful? Mm. So I think that goes back to, you know, finding balance with your priorities. I don't know what specifically this person's juggling with, but I know that when I was in school, I was trying to take at least 15 to 18 credit hours. I was planning for the next international trip, so getting passport, visa ready, application ready, applying to universities overseas, which is really time consuming. I was involved in activities on campus. I was also meeting with a success coach, which was really great for empowering me, but also took up more of my time. I also had a part-time job as an SAT tutor. So all of those things, you know, those were just my experience as a college student. If anybody else was experiencing something similar, um, then you probably had some periods of time in particular where you had really heightened levels of stress. Um, I would recommend really coming up with a schedule that you think is going to work for you. So again, once you list your values, so if your value is having a work-life balance, um, then I want you to think critically about how many credit hours you should be taking in order to achieve that balance. It's going to look different for everyone. It really depends on your nature as a student, the classes that you're taking. Some are going to be harder than others, right? Um, it depends on a lot of factors, but decide for you how many credit hours do I need um, to still maintain my status as a student, especially if you're getting financial aid or all of this other type of aid, um, but also how can I also make some space in my life for adventure, for excitement, for trying new experiences and for trying new things? Um, so set those priorities and those values and then come up with a regular schedule that works for you. I know most college students don't have class every day because y'all are free to make up your own schedule. And hopefully you did not give yourself classes Monday through Friday um, if you have the choice not to. Um, but on days when you can have structure, give yourself some structure. 
Um, I think most people do benefit from having structure and consistency in their life, even if it isn't 24 seven. Yeah, give yourself some space for fun, but give yourself space to actually sit down and get things done. Um, that way you can feel good about your fun and you don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel like you're beating yourself up for it because I've definitely done that to myself. I was a great student, grade point average drop wise, but probably not the best at time management or procrastination in undergrad or in grad school, if I'm being completely honest with you. Um, so being able to uh, set that schedule for yourself right off the bat, I think could be the first step to give you space for a little bit of freedom and a little bit of play and exploration. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, our next question is, why is mindfulness important beyond the scope of personal life and well-being? Mm, I love that question. Um, I was looking at that question yesterday. And I was like, dang, I cannot wait until we get to that question. I think a lot of the times part of the marketing and rebranding of mindfulness is this idea of what's in it for me, right? I want to reduce my stress. I want to understand my emotions better. I want to uncover imbalances in my life. Um, it's all about what I might get from something. Um, and instead, when we are really being true to the core and the essence of mindfulness, it's not just a me thing, it's actually a we thing. Um, so mindfulness practices can really enhance our empathy, our sense of compassion, our sense of interconnectedness um, to other things. And so part of using mindfulness critically and using it as a tool of self-transformation is also thinking about how yourself fits in the context of the rest of the world. If we're looking at imbalance and we're looking at um, balances and imbalances within your community, right? Uh, maybe your community is the Florida State uh, student body population, right? Maybe it's a little bit smaller and it's the friends who are in your close network or your close personal uh, circle whatever your community looks like, you may ask yourself, how do I give? How am I of service to a community? Um, I believe that a big part of yoga, mindfulness, um, and these type of spiritual spiritual based practices is about union. Uh, so yoga is actually Sanskrit for the word union, which is about coming together. Um, and so practices like this help to enhance our ability to come together as a community. Um, and imagine just the power of using mindfulness at a community level to enact transformation and personal and community empowerment. I mean, you know, where that goes is really endless. Um, so I think there's a lot of value in really thinking about and considering how your mindfulness practice extends outside of just you um, and also to the other people around you, because it definitely does. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I know that, like, for example, I've seen a lot of stuff on social media that makes it seem like it's a very personal, very self-reflective thing. So taking it out to other people, I'm sure is just it helps you with mindfulness a lot. Um, our next question is, how can we take the brief moments at school and work to be mindful? So, you know, I don't know how long these brief moments are. I don't know if this is something as far as, you know, you're walking to class. Uh, there are so many different types of meditations that we can get into as well. There's visualization exercises. Uh, where you can visualize yourself at a certain point in time, uh, past, present, or future, um, and really use deep breathing to help you um, kind of visualize even better. Um, they're walking meditation. So as you're walking the class, you could actually do uh, meditative work um, and kind of help you get from A to B, help you get some physical activity in um, and help you kind of attune into your internal state while you're doing that physical activity. Um, other brief moments, there's really no limit um, to the moments and the times during the day where you can pause for a mindfulness check-in. Uh, there's no set amount of time that you have to practice in order for it to be categorized as mindfulness. So you could really take 15 seconds uh, before you go into the door to start your work day to take a couple of deep breaths to help you mentally reset to look around and say, okay, yes, this is where I am. I'm going into the workspace. Whatever I was doing before I came into the workspace will have to wait until after I leave, right? Um, 
that's also a mindfulness practice. Um, so it's not limited to just, you know, we, where can I pause and where can I sit on a meditation cushion, crisscross applesauce, and like breathe for at least 15 minutes. Um, because for many people, especially like I said, we're products of a hyperproductive society. Um, so that idea of pausing intentionally for long periods of time may not seem realistic or attainable for a lot of people maybe start by finding one to three times in the day where you can pause for however many seconds to just note how you're feeling, to note how you're feeling internally, and to transition from one moment to the next. So transitioning from school to work, transitioning from work to home, uh, transitioning from being in bed to waking up and starting your day. Uh, transitions and noting those can be also really important times to like check in and try to be mindful. Awesome, thank you. So our next question comes in the chat from John, and it says, a lot of recent discussion in psychology and self-help spaces have been about resilience. Do you think the concept of resilience has the same pitfalls as mindfulness? I think you're still muted. Yes. There we go. All right. I think in some ways, yes, and in other ways, no. Um, resilience in and of itself isn't commodified or colonized in the same way as like mindfulness is. So mindfulness is really a practice that has become very science-based um, in the U.S., but grew out of a series of spiritual practices um, in the Black and Brown cultures. Um, and so we really have to consider that when we're thinking about how we use mindfulness day to day. Resilience is a tool, and in some ways it's a theory, um, but it doesn't have the same history as the mindfulness practices do. So it doesn't really fall into that type of pitfall. I do think, though, that it can fall into this pitfall within the wellness culture and wellness industry in particular, of feeling like um, the goal of everything is to be resilient and to be able to overcome every adversity, every setback, um, and if you don't, maybe you're not resilient enough and maybe you need to learn how to enhance your own resilience. Yes, I do think that it's important that we can bounce back from challenges in life. Depending on what the challenge is, some bounce back is going to be a little bit easier than others. Some is going to be really, really challenging to be able to bounce back to things like super timely. Um, it's interesting to me that in the age of social media um, and technology, that words like resilience can really develop a life of its own, similar to mindfulness. And again, people can end up internalizing um, unjust systems uh, that are really working against them or were never really created for them and feel like because they're struggling to find freedom or autonomy within an unjust system that there is some way that they need to be resilient. Yeah, we might need to be resilient in that we need to recognize that this isn't about us. This is really about the cost of living in an unjust system. Um, but we got to be careful about how much of the outside and external culture we internalize and we make it all about us. Um, and I think that that's something that resiliency and mindfulness, when it's kind of commodified and packaged in the way that it is now, um, there's a risk that we can fall into that. Right, where we end up taking on problems of culture, of society, um, of you know, socioeconomic status and race and religion, right? And all these things that create so much polarization. And we find ways to really internalize it and say, you know, this is my fault. Uh, this is something that I did. When really, for most of us, it's something that we grew up in and it's something that we internalize and we reproduce because that's how we were taught to do it. And no one taught us how to think any differently. Um, so I hope that that answers your question. I'm just skimming through the chat and I noticed he was saying, you know, in his view, resilience can be individually helpful, but the concept is very often used as a way to induce hyperproductivity and heighten the amount of injustice that one person can tolerate. Totally agree with that. I don't have much to add to that at all. Uh, I think resilience can also be a powerful tool socially um, and collectively when we're able to come together. And that might also help to decrease um, that hyper productivity and that internalization where we feel like it's all about us. When we see a group of people come together who feel like they've been treated unjustly or feel like they've been treated unfairly or see others being treated unfairly and they want to say something about it, um, then that can also take some of the pressure off the individual. All right, thanks for the question, John. Um, I hope I answered it. Perfect, thank you so much. 
Okay, our next question is, as an undergraduate student, did you know that this was an area of interest for you? Um, I knew pretty early on that I wanted to study sociology and psychology. I knew that I was really interested in the study of people. Um, I was really interested in what makes people tick and how people think and why people do the things that they do. Um, but a mindfulness practice was not at all. Um, it was not something that I really um, made a conscious effort to learn about or to practice um, during my undergraduate study. I was someone who was really interested in learning about different cultures and different religions. Um, and I had friends of diverse cultures who would invite me into some of their religi uh, religious practices, uh, which was really amazing. But I never really attached to one um, over the other. It was really the process of being in life um, and dealing with life outside of school, dealing with you know breakdown of relationships, dealing with stressful jobs, that's what got me into a mindfulness practice. Um, and specifically, I wasn't just looking for a tool of personal transformation. I was looking for ways to forgive myself uh, for maybe uh, things that I've done, things I'd experienced, or things that at the time I categorized as mistakes, right, that I had made. And I wanted to find ways to feel connected to the rest of my community. Um, and so that's kind of what started my mindfulness practice more so than school. Um, but I think that in grad school, uh, some of the work that I was doing with the clinical work, psychology, social work, um, I was really able to combine some mindfulness practices into what I was learning about clinical work, uh, which I think just empowers uh, my perspective as a clinician. That's so interesting. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, our next question is, what student organizations or activities were you involved in on campus that made an impact in your career progression and interest in social services? Um, I was initially very nervous about being involved in school activities. I am typically very introverted and even more so fresh out of high school. I was 17 uh, coming onto a college campus where I did not know anybody. Um, one of the greatest impacts that I had starting off my freshman year was getting connected with a success coach. Um, and at first I was really uh, not about it. <laughs> I'll be honest, I was not about it. I was like, you know, I have over 4.0 grade, grade point average. I'm doing fine maintaining my classes. I do not need a success coach. And when I went into that first session, what I realized is I could use some skills to advocate for myself. There were things I wanted to do on campus that I was nervous about initiating, that my success coach really encouraged me and kind of walked me through that process. Um, and so I would say starting off my first year, getting connected with, this, with a success coach was probably had the greatest impact um, on my undergraduate study. Through my success coach, I ended up joining um, an organization called Without Words. I don't know if Without Words is still a part of Florida State campus, um, but every year they would have um, an interactive event that we've put together uh, that's highlighted different issues. So the year that I was a co-chair um, for one of the events, the issue that we were highlighting was like child soldiers um, in Africa and some of the work and the labor and the atrocities that these child soldiers are made to take on. Um, and so that was a really impactful experience. Again, you know, I had to work with different people on campus. I'm learning new skills like budgeting, like time management, right, that I've never had to practice before, which was really cool. And then, like I said in the beginning, I was fortunate enough to have so many study abroad opportunities. Um, I learned pretty early on that I was curious about travel. Um, and once, I think it was in the summer between freshman and sophomore year, I went to London for social psychology. It happened to be when the Olympics were in London during the summer. Um, so it was just like a crazy time to like be in London um, and be experiencing all of that. And I definitely got the travel bug. And every year afterwards, I devoted at least one semester uh, to being able to travel abroad. Um, so I think that those experiences uh, really, really helped me a lot in the social services field. It helped me to be able to connect with people of different mindsets, of different cultural beliefs. Um, from just different backgrounds than I'm from. 
it helped me see the interconnectedness in all living things, uh, which even though I wasn't into mindfulness, definitely wasn't into yoga when I was in undergrad, I could appreciate uh, the beauty in different people's stories and in their life experiences. Um, and again, that only enhances uh, the clinical work that I do as a clinician. Um, so if you can get involved in campus, do it. Um, if traveling is anything that you're remotely curious about and you have an opportunity to tap into that while you're on campus, do it. Um, there are just so many resources and scholarships and opportunities available to students that aren't necessarily there when you graduate. And tell me that, uh, that when you go out into the real world, you know, traveling to the Netherlands for four months is kind of pricey. Um, so take full advantage. Uh, you never know what experiences you have in undergrad that can propel you later down the line. That's awesome, thank you. Yes, getting involved on in campus is so important. It's definitely helped me as a freshman to just like ask questions, like <laughs> see what's going on because there's so much happening. Yeah. Okay, your next question is, so you referenced pitfall, pit, pitfalls to mindfulness. Can you expand on those pitfalls and how we might avoid them? Yeah, so really the pitfalls to mindfulness is when we use mindfulness as just a coping tool to deal with some of the stressors of day to day without critically thinking about and challenging where those stressors come from and how we might be able to solve the root of the problem instead of dealing symptoms of the problem. Um, there are probably other pitfalls of mindfulness that you can fall into, but for the sake of time um, that we have left, that would be the key one that I might kind of hone in and focus on a little bit. Um, and the reason for that is because the culture that we live in um, regurgitates mindfulness in this way that um, if you meditate for 15 minutes three times a week, then all your problems would be solved. And the reality is for many people, if they meditate three times a week and they are products of this hyper productivity and they have fallen victim to it, what they might realize is that their lives are unsustainable as it's going. Um, and that can be really, really stressful to come to that realization and be stuck in the middle of all of these things that you constantly feel like you have to do. Um, so being able to take a step back and really see, you know, how do the things that I'm doing in the way that I'm living my life, how do they serve me within this collective? How do they serve my values? How do they honor my priorities? Um, and then using a mindfulness tool to really sit down and to reflect on some of that, to um, just be present with what you're feeling, right? To accept the feelings that may come up at the time uh, without attaching a whole story to it, that might help you develop a really strong mindfulness practice. Um, most people who you know find themselves really engrossed in the mindfulness community um, and mindfulness philosophy find that they have to make significant changes to their life um, to be able to have the life that they dreamed of and perform at their natural best while still finding many moments throughout the day and throughout their experience to pause and to be and to be present. That's so true, thank you. Okay, so what drew you to the field of social work and how do you practice mindfulness in your work? Um, I probably would have studied social work in undergrad if I knew that social work was something for me to study in undergrad. Um, I ended up studying sociology and psychology because that seemed like a good overlap of studying people and studying the mind. Social work though is kind of that overlap between people and the mind. So I definitely feel like there are other fields that maybe would have been um, a little bit uh, more applicable for me, um, but I'm definitely happy with the field that I ended up studying with. Um, um, let me think. I'm sorry, what was the question again? I feel like I went off track. <laughs> no, you're good. So it's what you do to the field of social work. And then how do you practice mindfulness in your work? 
Okay, so after I got my degree, I ended up working for an elementary school. I was a reading interventionist, so I was really into research, like I said, I wrote the honors thesis, so I wanted to be a part of a research team. I would studied educational psychology in the Netherlands, so I was really curious about how people learn and how people retain information. I felt like that was a cool entry-level position for me where I can be a part of a team and where I'm teaching young kids who are struggling in school how to read um, and seeing some of their impact over time. Um, and then from there, uh, one of my coworkers actually was interested in being a child protective investigator. She was a little bit older than I was and felt like maybe her time had passed. I'd never even heard of the field, but I thought, why not apply? I got through a very strenuous application process and um, you know, that was my first introduction to social work. Uh, was being in that field. It is more than just dipping your toe in. It's like diving into the deep end uh, because you are seeing your community at a different level than you've probably ever seen it. Um, so I've never seen, you know, growing up so many people struggling with addiction, struggling with domestic violence, struggling with child abuse and neglect, struggling with poverty, um, food insecurity. Um, and so I just got a really rough introduction into some of the stressors and some of the things that people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I was really curious about how I could help, honestly, how I could be of service. I think a big part of my value system is just being of service. I think that that's really important. Um, so from there, you know, I was in child protection, working 65 hours a week, I got burnt out. I transitioned into child welfare case management, uh, was driving around to people's houses all day, every day, got burnt out from that, but also learned a lot of tools. I realized in order for me to do the impactful work I really wanted to do and empower people to make the changes that I really felt was within reach for them that I needed to go back to school and I needed to study to become a therapist. Um, found a program that I felt like would be a good overlap for me because as much as I love clinical work, I'm also, if you don't already know, I'm a huge advocate. Um, so advocacy services are really important. That tied me into clinical social work. Um, and yeah, that led me to the, the field that I'm in right now. That's so fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so we're at our last um, pre- submitted questions. So if you have any other questions, make sure that you type them into the chat now. And our last question is, for those of us that feel we don't have time to practice mindfulness, what can we alter in our day to day to help with that? Um, so I was often told by my first mindfulness instructor that if you don't have time for mindfulness, you need to practice it twice as much <laughs> as the average person. And the reason for that is mindfulness is more than just a tool to help you cope with the stressors of day to day. It's more than a tool um, where if you can just find time to squeeze it in, then you can do even more in your day. In fact, mindfulness shows you where you can stand to pause a little bit more where you can stand to be present. It highlights areas of your life where you maybe haven't been as present. Um, and so if you can't make time to meditate, um, I ask if you make time to breathe, if you make time to have a thought, if you make time to walk anywhere, if you make time to eat at any point during the day, um, if you make time to go from one activity to the next. So again, transition from work to school or from school to home. Uh, then you have time to meditate. Like I said, it doesn't have to be a 15 minute practice. It can really be 15 seconds in a day where you check in, maybe you take a breath or two, maybe you ask yourself what you're feeling, you look around you and you orient yourself into whatever it is that you're about to transition into. Uh, mindfulness practices can really be as simple as that. And yes, there are tangible effects uh, to be able to orient yourself to the present um, and practice that often. Cameron, I had a quick question. Um, just since we're all addicted to our cell phones and tablets and, and everything like that, is there an app that you would put, you know, your name behind and say, this is an okay app to download? Yeah, there are so many mindfulness apps out there um, and so many that get a lot of like uh, play space on the internet as well. Um, there are a few that I've used before. There are some that I'll be honest, I feel like fall into that same 
um, pitfall of you know that hyper productivity uh, culture. I think one that I use a lot presently is called Insight Timer. Um, and so I will type that in along with that name of the book that I was talking about before I forget. All right, so Insight Timer is the name of the app. Um, what I like about this app and what makes it really cool for me is that you can meditate and do yoga with practitioners all over the world. Um, so the app has international yoga and meditation instructors um, of all different body types, of all different ethnicities. So it's not just for people who are able-bodied. Um, it really is for everybody. They also have communities, they have forums. Um, so if they're, you know, if you're really into uh, sports, I'm not, uh, but if you're really into sports or something um, and you want to be a part of a meditation and sports little community or forum, you can join that too and kind of find opportunity for community. Um, I think for as much as we like to sometimes, or I like to sometimes hate on social media and hate on uh, the internet and some of the pitfalls of this hyper-produced culture, um, I think that there are definitely some advantages to it. It can bring people together. Um, and I think that that's a really good app that brings people together you can also donate and support the teachers that you end up teaching from. So you are able to contribute to their livelihood as well, um, which helps to um, highlight that sense of interconnectivity. So yeah, Insight Timer is one I definitely recommend. Awesome, thank you so much. And while you type that book name or book title in there, I did wanna say you, you had talked about um, success coaching here. And so now, I think that now they call the program College Life Coaching. And so I, I'm going to put the link in here since you referenced it a couple times, just for our students who might want to um, look into that, that are here now. But I just want to thank you. I think that was almost as helpful for me as it probably was for students too, um, just from working every day. And then um, it's just the busyness and you're right. If we can take time to eat or to walk from one place to the, to the next, we can take time to be mindful. Um, so I really appreciate um, all of your guidance today and your words of wisdom. And for those of you that might have um, not felt like you could ask a question or want to ask a question, please feel free. I'm going to send a follow-up email after with the recording of this, because if you want to go back and revisit anything she said, you'll have the recording. And then if you have any questions that you think about later, um, feel free to email me and I'm sure I can forward it to Cameron and she'd be happy to address it. Um, but I'm so thankful for you for being here today and for taking your time to engage in this way and for you, Peyton, as well, for, for moderating today. It was a great session, but I'll let you, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else before we wrap up today, Cameron. Um, no, just thank you for your time. Thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity. I feel like I learn as much from uh, these workshops or these conversations as y'all may learn. Um, all of the questions are an opportunity for me to go back and to relearn as well. Um, so I'm really grateful for it. If you've got any questions, feel free to send them to Amy. I'm happy to answer them um, as they come through my way. Um, I also, you know, I have a private practice, so I do have my own website as well. If you ever wanted to contact me directly, um, that is also an avenue and a resource for you. I can real quick just type that website into the chat um, just so you have it. Um, and then I am a mental health practitioner, so I do have my own private practice. If you ever feel like you need therapeutic needs, Florida State, like most Florida universities, has a really great student resource center um, that includes things like therapists, coaches, uh, that can help guide you through some transitions. Um, but if for whatever reason that doesn't feel like a good fit, I encourage you to reach out um, to find a therapist that is a good fit. Um, and if you ever you know, look at my website and you think, you know, this might be a good fit, uh, go ahead and reach out to me. We'll have a conversation. Okay. All right, that's all I got for you, Amy. Thank you so much, Peyton. You were a great moderator. Couldn't even tell that this was your first time. You were like a pro. Um, and thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you, Cameron. And I hope all of you have a great day. Bye. Bye.